Welcome to episode 81, Co-Occurring Recovery, Treating Mental Health and Addiction Side-by-Side, featuring David Deutsch, licensed clinical social worker and certified addiction treatment counselor, by Clearly Clinical, Learn, Grow, Shine. Hello, my name is David Deutsch, and we're going to be talking today about co-occurring disorders, but the title of the presentation I'm going to be doing is actually Co-Occurring Recovery, Treating Mental Health and Addiction Side-by-Side. I have worked in the field of mental health and substance use disorder treatment for the last 16 years, since 2004. I've worked primarily with people who have mental illness, um, oftentimes who are people who are homeless, and people who have substance use disorders. While I've worked with people who have only mental illness or a substance use disorder, most of my career has been spent working with people who have what are called co-occurring disorders, meaning they have both a mental health disorder and a substance use disorder. I am a licensed clinical social worker and a certified addiction treatment counselor. I have a lot of lived experience myself, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation. I will be happy to share that with you uh, at any time in the future as well. If you have questions um, that you would like to email me about, I'll be providing you with information for how to contact me at the end of the presentation. But glad to have the opportunity um, to present this material today. So why would we call something co-occurring recovery when we always talk about co-occurring disorders? The reason I like to call it co-occurring recovery is because it's a strengths-based approach. People can and do recover from both mental health disorders and substance use disorders. So I think it's really important to frame it from a recovery-based kind of perspective. Co-occurring disorders for many years in our field of, of substance use disorder treatment was called dual diagnosis. And you still do hear that term periodically. But it got to be confusing for people because they weren't sure whether dual diagnosis meant um, a uh, comorbidity, a medical disorder along with a substance use disorder or a mental health disorder and a um, medical disorder. So by using the term co-occurring disorder in the field of treatment, it really informs us in a way that lets us know that means we're talking about somebody who has both a mental health disorder and a substance use disorder. And of course, it means people that have both a mental health disorder and a substance use disorder. And that's um, why we use that term. Now, in 2014, there were approximately 7.9 million adults in the United States that had what are called co-occurring disorders. That number may be a little bit of an underestimation because it may, in fact, be much more than that. Um, oftentimes, people don't report that they have um, a mental health disorder uh, if they're getting substance use disorder treatment or the other way around. There's a lot of stigma, as we know, in our society around both mental health disorders or substance use disorders. So oftentimes we find that they really are underreported. It can be difficult to diagnose somebody with a co-occurring disorder, especially in the early stages of treatment. Often people come in for treatment for substance use um, uh, disorders that seem to have symptoms of a mental health disorder. And upon uh, treatment, over a period of a few days or a few weeks, we end up determining that they do not have a co-occurring co disorder, but that the symptoms that seem to be mental illness were in fact <coughs> um, symptoms that were substance-induced, um, substance-induced psychosis, um, other substance-induced um, symptoms that we might associate with a mental health disorder, anxiety, depression, things like that that can also very much be tied to the use of various substances. So important to kind of understand that um, going in. Sometimes we would say that you should really have 30 days of evaluating somebody for their substance use disorder before we even give them a diagnosis of a mental health disorder. However, the nature of the field that we work in is such that it's expected that there will be at least a provisional diagnosis given in the early stages of treatment. And from an insurance industry perspective, in terms of private sector treatment, it's required that you provide a diagnosis on at least a provisional basis for that. So we want to be mindful of that as well. Persons who have co-occurring disorders um, have biological, psychological, and social components to their conditions. So if you're familiar with the biopsychosocial model of treatment, then you're probably aware of that. But if we look at it from a, um, a critical point of view, we know that people um, 
often have a biologic compo component to their mental health disorder or their substance use disorder. There are certainly candidate genes, um, what we would call candidate genes for people who have um, mental health disorders and substance use disorder, meaning that there is a prevalence in their family, someone either in their immediate family or their extended family, um, that um, has um, that has a diagnosis of a mental illness or that has had a history of substance use disorders, thereby making the person potentially um, more likely to have a mental health disorder or a substance use disorder. We know that prevalence rates um, definitely have a genetic component to that. People that have um, close relatives who have schizophrenia, for example, are more likely to have schizophrenia than someone from the general population. But just because you have schizophrenia in your family does not mean that you will have it yourself, and it doesn't mean that your children um, will have it themselves. It just means that there's a greater probability that you might have it than somebody from the general population. So the symptoms of co-occurring disorders are certainly something that can be complex. Important to understand that a person with either a mental health disorder or a substance use disorder is likely at least 50% of the time to have a co-occurring disorder as well. So if you work in the field of substance use disorder treatment, you will always be also working with people who have mental health disorders and the other way around. Um, if you work with somebody who has a mental health disorder, there's at least a 50% chance that they will have a co-occurring substance use disorder. In certain populations, the rate is greater than 50%. I would say in my experience working with a homeless population, and working with people coming out of situations of incarceration, uh, it has been more like six, 65 to 80 percent um, of a prevalence rate um, of co-occurring disorders. Now, I don't. I'm, I'm speaking from my personal experience here. You would have to look at studies um, that are evidence-based to actually show that. So, be important. I want you to understand that you're hearing my opinion, and based, um, ba I'm basing that on my experiences. There is a very high prevalence of substance use disorders amongst people in the prison population. And I can share with you that many people who have, um, who are in prison have had long histories of substance use disorders. Many of them have mental health disorders as well. The other qualification that I want to put in that is that oftentimes it's important um, that we realize that the, while the prominent features of the person we're treating may be the substance use disorder features, that the mental health disorder um, component is not necessarily at the severe end of the spectrum. Many people are at the mild to moderate end of the spectrum in terms of their mental health disorder when we talk about the co-occurring disorder. So um, the stereotypical um, thought that usually pops to mind is a person who's using drugs who has um, at the, who's at the severe end of the spectrum who has bipolar 1 disorder or schizophrenia or major depressive disorder. That can be the case, and certainly it's often the case, but it's not always the case. We have people oftentimes who are more at the moderate end of the spectrum in terms of the mental health disorder. So I wanted to make sure that we qualify that. So let's talk a little bit about mental health disorders. Mental health disorders uh, can be characterized by changes in mood, thought, patterns, and behaviors. They impact your activities of daily living to the point where it impairs the ability to function. Generally speaking, we are talking about the social, occupational, educational, and even legal domains um, of a person's life. So if any of those domains are significantly impacted or impaired, we start to think that um, somebody has um, a challenge or ultimately maybe a diagnosis of a mental health disorder. It affects uh, 43.6 million adults age, ages 18 and older, or about 18.1% of the population every year in this country, in the United States. Um, it's often used, um, a general term for that, it's often used that one in four adults age 18 or older has some sort of a diagnosis of a mental health disorder, which is 25%, which is more than the 18.1%. Um, so that's a matter of question um, and a matter of judgment, perhaps. Again, remember that, that one in four people or that 18%, if that's the lower number that you go with, does not always mean they're at the severe end of the spectrum. It just means that they have somewhere from the mild to moderate end of the spectrum or to the severe end of the spectrum. So we're including all um, levels of the spectrum from mild to moderate to severe in that. For mental health disorders in this day and age, treatment 
for the disorder often involves the use of psychiatric medications. That's not always the case, but it is very, very often the case. So important to understand that. And if you work in this field, you know, you're certainly well aware of that. There are very few people in our society whose lives have not been touched either directly or indirectly by mental health disorders. Either they have one themselves or a diagnosis themselves. Someone in their family has it. Somebody close to them have, has that diagnosis. There are very, very few people who haven't been either directly or indirectly um, touched in some way. So let's go over some basics about some mental health disorders. We won't have time to really go into an in-depth analysis of each one or description, but it's important to have at least kind of an overview. So in terms of first, the, the first mental health disorder we want to look at is schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a thought disorder. It impacts 1% of the world's population. Um, no matter where you are, um, in the, uh, whether you're in a, a major city like Los Angeles or whether you are in a rural village in Thailand, 1% of the population um, of people in the world will have a diagnosis of this. It is a um, very much a biological um, reality. It is something that has been with us for many, many um, you know, centuries, probably thousands of years. It's something that is still in the gene pool. People with schizophrenia um, tend to have slightly better immune systems than the general population. And theoretically, a lot of um, studies have been done indicating that that may be why it persists in the gene pool, um, because it does have that um, component um, of having a stronger immune system. It is something that we would consider to be a serious mental health disorder. Um, I, you don't think, I don't think you would ever hear anybody saying somebody has mild schizophrenia. It's always considered to be um, at the severe end of the spectrum. Bipolar disorder is something that we have um, read and heard so much about over the last two decades. It's a mood disorder. It impacts about 2.9% of the population in our, in our society. And that includes both bipolar one disorder and bipolar two disorder. For those of you who work in the field, you know that bipolar 2 disorder is not as severe as bipolar 1 disorder, but, but any diagnosis of bipolar disorder carries with it the component of a manic phase and a depressive phase. That's just not always as extreme with bipolar 2 disorder as it is with bipolar 1 disorder. I want to make a little point here, which is that people with bipolar disorder um, oftentimes are people who can be very, very successful in certain industries in our society. Oftentimes people that are sales managers, great salespeople um, are people um, who have bipolar disorder. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that when you meet somebody who's in the sales industry who's successful, that you should immediately assume that they have bipolar disorder because that's not the case. I just want to make the point that we work with people in our society every day who have a diagnosis of mental health disorder or who are undiagnosed but have the mental health disorder who are doing very, very well and who are functioning very, very well in the capacity in which we might interact with them. That doesn't mean that they don't have challenges. It just means that we we work with people and interact with people every day who have a disorder and we're just not aware of it. I want to move on from that, <coughs> excuse me, to talking about depressive disorders. Depressive disorders are a mood disorder and it impacts 7% of the population. Major depressive disorder is the most severe type of mood disorder, but it's very, very important that you understand the prevalence of um, depressive disorders because they affect more people in our society than bipolar disorder and schizophrenia combined. It is a much more common diagnosis. There are various um, uh, levels of depressive disorder. Um, uh, major depressive disorder it tends to be something that we deal with a lot more in clinical settings because it does have such a dramatic impact on the uh, person's ability to function on a day-to-day -day basis. But many people in our society have what's called persistent depressive disorder, formerly known as dysthymic disorder. Persistent depressive disorder means that over for an adult, uh, over for over for the last two years, that you've had more days than not of feeling depressed, at least somewhat down and depressed. In a in a, a child or an adolescent, it's for one year, um, a shorter period of time. And what it really um, means is that the person may be able to function 
on a day to day basis. And we may, again, may interact with people all the time who have persistent depressive disorder, but we're not aware of the fact that they're really impacted by this on a daily or almost daily basis. It is very, very common in our society. I don't have the actual percentage of people that have um, specifically have persistent depressive disorder, but it's important to recognize that a lot of people have that. Because even if you're able to function with that, it doesn't mean that you have a good quality of life. And one of the things that we're concerned about with so much in the field of treatment, whether it's mental health disorders or substance use disorders, is making sure people have a good quality of life. That's a, actually a lot of what we do in all the helping professions. So I have a few de details about anxiety disorders. <clears throat> anxiety disorders um, include phobias, um, pan things like panic disorder, generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, which we now know affects many more people aside from the people that we stereotypically associate it with, who tend to be people who are coming back from military service or people in law enforcement um, or people that are um, working um, as firemen and things like that. But PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder affects 10% of women and 5% of men over the course of their lifetime. A lot of times when I, when I cite that statistic, people are really surprised that it affects more women than men. But if you give it some thought, um, that's probably not too big a surprise because the main reason it affects more women than men is because women are more often the, um, the victims of sexual abuse um, and they suffer tremendous trauma from the sexual abuse they experience. Again, sexual abuse in our society is underreported like many other um, like many other traumas that people experience. And sexual abuse um, of men is also very, very underreported, maybe even more so than women. So important to understand that and important to understand that PTSD does not result from a biological component um, in your brain. It's an external event that causes the trauma. We still don't really know why two people exposed to the same event, why one person might um, end up having PTSD and the other person not. So it may be that ultimately we find out there is a biological component to it, but for now um, we're not really aware of what that may, may be. With mental health disorders, it's important to understand um, that medications can help many people. Um, psychiatric medications are very effective in treating some illnesses. Um, but they tend to work better for some people than others, and we're not really sure why that's the case. However, what I can share with you in my experience is we are definitely aware that if you use alcohol or substances along with taking a psychiatric medication, the um, effectiveness of the medication is for the most part not necessarily rendered ineffective, but it's definitely rendered less effective. So that's something very um, key that I make sure I discuss with my clients who are co-occurring that if they continue to drink alcohol or use substances, the medication that their psychiatrist may be prescribing for them is probably not as likely to have nearly as um, an effective an impact on them. So I wanted to make sure that we're aware of that because it's an ongoing challenge in this field. I'd like to move on from that to talking about substance use disorders and wanted to give you some data on that um, because it's something that's often um, not understood by people in the general population. So in 2014 in the United States, there were 21.2 million people over the age of 12 with a substance use disorder, and that includes using alcohol or illegal drugs. I'm going to say that's probably a low estimate. People tend to underreport, <clears throat> especially if they're using illegal substances and they are worried about people knowing about that. Um, so, or they don't think that they have a disorder. Oftentimes, um, just like people who have mental illness don't think they have a mental health disorder, people who have substance use disorders think that they're just using recreationally and that it's not problematic for them. And that uh, leading into my next statement, it won't become as any surprise, only 2.5 million people of those 21.2 million people um, received uh, any kind of specialized treatment for their disorders, which is about 12% of the people that really are diagnosed with that. So it's really, um, there are multiple reasons for that. Again, sometimes people don't think they have a problem. Um, sometimes people know they have a problem, but they don't have insurance or they don't know where, uh, where to get treatment or they live in an area um, that it's, makes it very difficult geographically to access treatment. What's happened um, in terms of the last few years was the Affordable Care Act and the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act have removed some barriers to treatment. It's made treatment available 
um, to a lot of people who financially, economically, were not able to afford treatment in the past. So it is, um, it has improved this, the treatment um, options for people, but there's still many, many people who don't get treatment. But it has, it has made a positive impact in many uh, areas. I'd like to move from there into talking about some um, details about substance use disorder treatment for those people who do actually get treatment. It's important to understand that there are different levels of care and people need different levels of care uh, depending on when they enter the treatment field and depending on how severe their substance use disorder is. So the most serious um, or highest level of care that we would look at is what's in, called um, inpatient in a hospital setting actually where you need to be either um, uh, because of um, prevailing medical issues or possibly the detox um, need for alcohol or from a benzodiazepine is going to be so severe that it's only safest if you're in an actual hospital situation where there are medical staff available 24 hours a day. From there, you move into detoxification kind of level of care, which can be done, um, although that happens sometimes in hospitals, um, if it's not as severe, but you still need detox or detoxification services. It can be done in a treatment facility where there is a doctor, of, if not available or, um, 24 hours a day, available um, most of the time on, on a daily basis to help the person with the detoxification process. From there, the next level of care down is what's called RTC, or stands, which stands for Residential Treatment Center. Um, that's for people that need to be in a, um, in a setting where they're in residential treatment um, 24 hours a day, they live in residential treatment. Oftentimes it's for um, 30 to 60 days, sometimes even 90 days or longer. And they have programs and a highly structured schedule. They have therapy on a, a regular basis. They have group therapy. They have oftentimes 12-step um, meetings. Not always because there's a few facilities that don't buy into the 12-step um, model. But they are certainly people who have almost every waking hour of their day structured exercise, uh, meals, uh, healthy activities, um, outings where you go to places, um, depending on what the part of the country you're in, you might go to a beach or to the mountains, things like that. But really very, very structured um, daily regimen. Um, for people that are doing well in, R in RTC level of care, the next step down is what's called PHTP, which stands for partial hospitalization. It seems kind of strange to have the term PHP because you would almost make it think, that almost makes us think that you'd actually be going to a higher level of care because it has the term hospitalization in it. But it's really a partial program compared to a residential program. Usually people in a PHP level of care are then still participating in a lot of the same kind of activities that the RTC members would participate in, but they now are living back where, uh, back at home or they're living in a um, transitional situation and sometimes they come to a, a different site for most of their day, um, maybe from nine in the morning or eight in the morning till five or six in the evening. They spend most of their time in, the, uh, in those kind of activities. So um, it is the next level of care down from RDC. The step down in terms of level of care from PHP or partial hospitalization is IOP, intensive outpatient programs. Many people have heard of those IOP programs um, the term intensive is what's the uh, term to pay attention to here the most. It means you're, not, uh, you're, you're on an outpatient basis. You do not live in a facility um, or spend most of your time at a facility for treatment, but you do go to a facility on a regular basis to a treatment center of some sort. It varies from place to place. Um, oftentimes it's three or four days a week for four hours a day, usually at least 12 to 16 hours a week for several weeks um, before you are then ready to take the next step down in terms of level of care, and that's to outpatient treatment. People in outpatient treatment can go once a week, sometimes gradually if things are going well, it becomes every other week and then once a month, and sometimes people then stay in outpatient treatment and they just come in every three months. So that's kind of an overview of the various levels of care that you can have. There's individual and group counseling when you're getting treatment. There is cognitive behavioral therapy used. Motivational enhancement therapy, or what's called motivational interviewing, for those of you familiar with that. Very, very often, 12-step programs are considered a significant component of substance use disorder treatment. There's also now what's called medication-assisted treatment. That means that you are going to continue in treatment with a medication of some sort. And in our society these days, that is often um, um, associated 
with a medication assisted treatment for opioid disorders. Often that means um, a methadone treatment or suboxone, which are narcotic replacement therapies, um, therapies for people that have opiate disorder, opioid disorders. What we've discovered over the last 10 years or so is that there are a small percentage or a percentage of people who, if they are not given that medication assisted treatment, they will always relapse on their drug of choice, particularly um, heroin um, or other opiates, uh, no matter what their best intentions are. So it's really been a huge change in perspective um, over the years, and it's still controversial with some people really feeling like if you're on methadone or suboxone that you're just on a legal form of opiates and that you're really not in recovery. However, what we do know from studies is that people that are on those medications certainly don't have the legal challenges because they're not doing anything illegal anymore. And over time, what we know is they are less likely, far less likely to have serious medical challenges and they are able to work at their job, they work at work at a job, maintain a good quality of life. So it's really proved itself to be very effective for many, many people. Another element of substance use disorder treatment that's important to recognize is that recovery support services that are non-clinical are very important. And that means 12-step um, meetings, other sober activities where people support one another in their recovery. So there's not necessarily always going to be a clinical component to it. That can only take us so far. And I should, at this point, I am going to let you know that I'm in recovery myself. I am a recovering heroin and cocaine addict. I've been clean since June 21st, 2000. I now have almost 20 years in recovery, but it is definitely critical for me and my recovery that I have support services from people that are not clinicians. Although I love, I'm a clinician myself and I love the work that we do in this field. It's really, really important to recognize that that's a significant component of recovery for people. I will share a little bit about my um, lived experience a, a little bit later, and I won't go into too much depth because that's not the purpose of the presentation, but I did want people to know that I do have my own lived experience uh, many, many years um, in my addiction. My hard drug addiction, um, which was heroin and cocaine, ended in the early 1980s, but I continued to smoke marijuana all day, every day until the year 2000. In fact, until the day of um, June 20th, 2000. And uh, that um, a series of events led to me um, in short order giving that up. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. I want to talk now about the similarities of both disorders, of both mental health disorders and substance use disorders. In both cases, there are functional impairments <clears throat> when people's sim symptoms are prominent. So whether you have prominent symptoms of your mental health disorder or your substance use disorder, um, your functional impairments are going to be really noticeable. Ongoing efforts are required to maintain recovery in both disorders. There is no cure for a mental health disorder and there is no cure for a substance use disorder. We wish that there was. We wish that there was just some magical thing that could be done and the, and the person was cured, but it really is not the case. It's about ongoing efforts. Um, stigma and discrimination are very often barriers to treatment. In both cases, people in our society stigmatize people who have problems with drugs and alcohol, and they also still stigmatize people who have mental health disorders, although maybe a little bit less so than substance use disorders. And part of that is because people still feel like or often believe that people with substance use disorders uh, made a choice and that's why they have it, whereas people with mental health disorders didn't make a choice. In reality, um, people who have um, problems with substance use disorders, it's not a choice anymore either once it gets to a certain point. Certainly it was a choice to try it that first time, but many people try things for the first time and a percentage of people will end up having problems with that. That would be a topic that could be addressed as a whole separate um, topic for discussion, so we're not going to go into that here, but there's a good body of evidence that will let you know if you uh, research it that people with substance use disorders, in fact, have an illness. So the good news from all of this is that recovery is possible um, in terms of both co-occurring either disorder or a co-occurring disorder. Many people do, ha, can and do recover from their mental health and substance use disorders. I want to point out really quickly that family support is a critical component of this. In fact, family support for people who have mental health disorders is considered and most one of the most important components of a person's recovery. It can mean more than even having the best psychiatrist or the best clinician working with you. Now let's talk about some differences between both disorders. So lifelong medications 
protocols may be necessary for treatment of mental illness. Oftentimes it is for many, many people. Not always, because I do have worked with people who are on medications, who improve the quality of life and found ways to manage their life pretty effectively without taking the medications. But very, very commonly, people may be needing to take medications for the treatment of mental illness. Not always the case um, for substance use disorders. For many people, they may be on medications in the early stages of being treated for their substance use disorder, and then in, um, in a relatively short span of time, may not need those medications anymore. anymore. Sometimes they do, especially if they have the co-occurring, but sometimes not. So if um, abstinence from drugs and alcohol is considered a key component of recovery for substance use disorders. It's certainly helpful if a person with mental illness does not use drugs or alcohol, but it's not necessarily considered a key component of someone's recovery, um, where it very, very much is for people who have substance use disorders. Very few people are capable of using um, alcohol or drugs in moderation once they've been um, diagnosed with a full-blown substance use disorder. Um, that's not to say that there's not a few people who are not able to do that, because there certainly are. I've worked with them and I've met them. But for the most part, um, abstinence is considered to be the, uh, the textbook kind of protocol for people who have substance use disorders. Medication may only be used in the early stage of treatment for substance use disorders, and it may not be used at all. It may not be something that is ever seen as something that is needed to be used. So important to understand that. I want to move from the um, now next into really a big part of what we want to talk about here, which is the integrated treatment approach. First, it's important to understand that integrated treatment is what's called an evidence-based practice. And for something to be considered an evidence-based practice, it means that services that have consistently been used that have demonstrated their effectiveness in helping people to achieve their desired goals. For something to be designated as an evidence-based practice, it means that the effectiveness has been established through rigorous studies that obtain similar outcomes. So it can't just be one program that used a, an integrated treatment approach that was um, experienced positive outcomes for their clients. It means that that has been duplicated and studied multiple times um, and uh, similar results, similar positive outcomes have been realized and that's what makes it an evidence-based practice. So integrated treatment is a research proven model of treatment for people with mental illness and co-occurring substance use disorders. And it means that clients are going to receive combined treatment for both disorders at the same time. Clients will receive treatment for the disorders from the same practitioner or the same treatment team. And they will receive one consistent message about treatment and recovery from the team. So important to understand that. So the principles for integrated treatment are along the lines of what we're going to discuss next. Treatment specialists are trained to treat both mental health and substance use disorders. And I want to go uh, to the side a little bit on this for a minute, because this is a little bit of a challenge in our field. Many people who go into the addiction treatment counseling field are really focused at first on wanting to work with people who have substance use disorders. Many of um, them, including myself, I am a certified addiction treatment counselor, were motivated to go into the field as we got clean and sober ourselves and progressed in recovery and wanted to help other people who, like us, had had problems with substances. The question then arises, are those certified addiction treatment counselors well-trained enough in men treating mental health disorders to do an effective job because we want them to treat both the mental health and substance use disorder. And that's a challenge that we see in the staffing of programs that are um, attempting to do a good job with integrated treatment. Co-occurring disorders are treated based on the stage of recovery that is applicable to the client. So I want to talk about that a little bit. If you're not familiar with stages of change, really briefly what I want to go over um, uh, and you can, um, if, if you want to look up this, if you um, aren't aware of it yourself, a gentleman named Prochaska and De Clemente um, developed the stages of change model. The first stage of change is considered is what's called pre-contemplation. People don't even think they have a problem at all. It's never occurred to them. Um, they're fine, you know, with what they're doing. The pre-contemplation stage of substance use disorders is when people are using and having a good time and they have no reason to think that it might be problematic for them. Other people might think that they have a problem, but they themselves don't think that. The next stage on the stages of change is contemplation, where people are beginning to think about the possibility that they may in fact have a substance use disorder or a mental health disorder. 
they haven't decided that they do, but it's crossed their mind that maybe it is problematic for them. I went through all of these stages myself, by the way. The next stage, um, after you get to, uh, after you go through the contemplation stage and come to the conclusion that yes, in fact, I do have a problem. Um, some people stay stuck there. They have a problem and they know they have a problem, but they either don't want to get out of it or they are, can't imagine how they would get out of it. And that's the reality for a lot of people in their substance use um, disorders is that they feel trapped and that there's no way out. In reality, there is a way out, but they don't always see that at the time. The next st uh, stage of change that we look at is what's called the preparation stage, where you've accepted that you have a problem and you are wanting to do something about it and you're preparing to do that. Does that mean I'm going to go into treatment? Does that mean I'm going to get 12-step 12, um, 12 meetings, um, um, integrate those as a part of my life? What does that mean I'm going to do? Does that mean I'm going to uh, think that I can do that on my own? I just avoid going around people who are using or drinking alcohol. Um, I don't go to bars. I don't go to clubs. I don't go around any of the places where I always use. And some people, if, though it's rare, some people do manage to do it on their own or just with going to 12-step um, meetings or support groups. Other people really design in their preparation stages um, a formal program. I am going to be an outpatient um, pro in an outpatient program. I'm going to be in an inpatient program, whatever that may be, whatever the appropriate level of care is. So that's the preparation stage. Then the next stage is action. We're going to actually move from having prepared for what we're going to do to putting it into action. And we do whatever it is um, that we've decided is our plan. We implement that. We're in the action stage. We make that change in our lives to get clean and sober or to deal with our mental health issue, um, whether that means seeing a therapist, seeing a psychiatrist, seeing a doctor, whatever that may be. We move, um, if everything goes well, in the action stage, we move from there um, into a better place in our lives. Things are working effectively. We are in in a place where things are functioning well for us. And we are in what's called maintenance mode, where everything's gone well. And now we're just wanting to continue to maintain um, to, to maintain the quality of life that we've achieved, um, to appreciate the gains that we've made in our life, and to continue on a positive path down our lives um, for the rest of our lives. What happens sometimes for some people, um, and those of you who've worked in the field know this, is that people relapse. Sometimes they relapse on their drug of choice. Sometimes they think that they can drink because they've never had a problem with alcohol, but the problem's been other drugs. Sometimes they don't drink because alcohol's been their drug of choice, and but they think they can smoke marijuana or use some other drug. So they relapse and they end up um, not really back where they started because they've learned a lot, but they end up kind of back on the stages of change again. If you don't relapse, then you just continue in maintenance mode. Um, but if you relapse, you kind of are back on that. If you think of it as a wheel or a circle, you're back at the beginning. But usually pre-contemplation is not a reality anymore because you already knew you had a problem. Contemplation is usually a stage that you either um, move through very quickly or you don't have to move through at all because you already know, again, that you have a problem and you write it back into preparation stage. What am I going to do differently? Maybe I thought I could go with my out with my friends who were drinking and I wouldn't drink and I found out that I relapsed. So I have a new act, I have a new preparation plan that I have to work on that's going to mean that when I go back to my action stage, things are going to be a different um, kind of set of principles in my action stage that I'm going to use. And you're back in action stage, hopefully pretty quickly, and back to maintenance mode, and hopefully the relapse doesn't happen again. But oftentimes it does, and we can't get frustrated with people when that happens, because for many people it happens four, five, six, seven times before they are able to achieve long-term recovery. So I wanted to make sure we understand the stages of change. I discussed them mainly in terms of substance use disorders, but they are very applicable for mental health disorders at, at times as well. Not for everyone, because people at the severe end of the spectrum with mental health disorders are sometimes not um, able to follow the stage of change model as well. So important to remember that. Motivational interventions are used to treat clients in all stages of change, but they're especially used in the contemplation and preparation stages of, ch uh, stages of change. So important to kind of remember that. It is a key component of treatment, particularly for substance use disorders. So principles for integrated treatment. I want to understand, I want to talk about that for a minute as well. So a cognitive behavioral approach is used for clients in the active treatment and in the relapse prevention stages. It's really important 
um, in this day and age to be well versed in cognitive behavioral therapy and to be able to use that approach. We use it all the time in many, with many of our other clients for many reasons, but particularly for people with co-occurring, that can be very effective. Individual, group, and family counseling is utilized along with self-help groups. So again, the formal counseling, the formal treatment approach needs to be conjoined with self-help groups um, for people to have the best chance of a positive outcome. I'm not saying that you cannot go to self-help groups and be okay. You can. I'm just saying that the more things you do that mix um, the formal kind of treatment and counseling with your own self-help approach, whether it's 12-step meetings, other types of self-help groups, the better um, probability you'll have of achieving a long-term successful uh, outcome for yourself. Medication services are integrated and they are coordinated with psychosocial services. And by that, we mean that there's a team working together. Um, so it's not just your psychiatrist over in one office or over in one building providing the medication services um, and then you you get your treatment from your other services um, other people in the community or other people on the treatment team everybody works together as an integrated team and everybody's aware of what every component of that team is doing so there again treatment is very integrated the treatment targets individual needs and it's integrated on organizational and clinical levels so the mental health and substance use disorder treatment are evaluated and addressed by the same team at the same location and at the same time. An agency that I worked for about um, five and six years ago, one of the things they did best was our psychiatrist was right in the same um, office building. I mean, literally, we were in the same exact place. And many of our clients told me, that what I really like best about coming here is I can see my psychiatrist right here. I can walk out of his office and you and, and David, you're my therapist and you're right here. I don't have to go to another place down the road or down the to a different building. You know, you're right here. The rest of your team is here. The count my counselors are here. After I see you for therapy, I meet with my counselor. My case manager's here. The nurse that administrates administers the medication to me is right here. It's very helpful to me. So I heard that from many of my clients and it really hit home with me just how important that integrated treatment approach was for people. So let's talk a little bit about the integrated treatment recovery model. Hope is critical for people that are in who are having co-occurring uh, disorders and who are feeling like um, they may never be able to get back on track with their life or in the case of some people get on track for the first time as an adult. Oftentimes we are holding the hope for our clients in that situation. They sometimes do not have much hope for themselves and they feel defeated. They feel like things are pointless. They feel like there's really um, not much chance that things are going to get better for them. So it's really important that we hold the hope for them or maintain their level of hope and encourage them and let them know that recovery is possible, that we believe that they have the ability to recover and that with our support that we're going to help uh, come alongside them and help make that happen. But again, it's we're coming alongside them. We can't fix them. They don't need to be fixed. They just need support and help. So in the integrated treatment recovery model, services and treatment goals are client driven. That is very, very important. What we want to make sure that we do is understand what the client's goals are and what they are really wanting for themselves. And sometimes the client's goals are just to be able to cut back on the amount of marijuana they're smoking, for example, cut back on the, on the amount of alcohol that they're consuming, for example. They may not have a goal of complete abstinence. They may have a goal of, what, um, of just reducing their consumption. We will look at that as what's an effective, um, called an effective harm reduction approach. Harm reduction, again, is a topic that we could address in an entire another hour um, or multiple hours um, of discussion, but I just wanted to bring that up here. Um, but it's important to understand that the services and treatment goals are always client driven. What, did the, what does the client want? What's their motivation? We provide our clients with unconditional respect and we have compassion for our clients. That is critical. No matter how difficult of a situation the client is, is in, and no matter how hard it may be to treat them, we always maintain our level of respect for them and we always maintain our compassion for them. Integration, integrated treatment specialists are responsible 
for engaging our clients and for supporting their recovery. That is our role. Our role is not to hold them to the rules of the program or hold them to the, if you're in a residential facility, not to hold them to the rules of the facility. The rules do exist, but that's not really our job. They're responsible for holding themselves um, responsible on some level. We can only be there to support, but our job is really to engage with our clients and to support them, not to judge them and not to criticize them. The integrated treatment recovery model um, not only focuses on clients' goals, but we focus on client goals and functioning, not on adhering to treatment. Again, not on following the rules. We want to look at what are their goals and how are they functioning. And that's really the element that we are wanting to be engaged with and focused on. Client choices, shared decision making, and client family education are an important component of the integrated treatment recovery model. The client must always be involved um, in any of the decision-making processes. Integrated treatment is associated with reduced substance use. It's associated with an improved le level of functioning. It's definitely associated with many decreased hospitalizations, fewer arrests for people ending up in the legal system. Um, it definitely is associated with an improvement in psychiatric symptoms and it's associated in an, with an improved quality of life. And that's one of the things, that, again, going back to that, we discussed that earlier. That's really what we're trying to do, is help people improve the quality of life. So I wanted to make sure that we discuss that. I'd like to briefly touch on a couple of things here. One, um, prevention, which you, we don't always think of um, when we're in the treatment field because we're kind of, um, the per we're downstream. The person's already kind of made their way down to us. But it's important to have a, a prevention um, perspective as well. So early detection of mental illness um, can be a key to prevention. We are doing a better job of that in the field now than we've done in the past. Also, I want to make sure that people realize that mental illness precedes the substance use disorder about 80% of the time. Something else that we now know from recent studies is that marijuana use is associated with psychosis. So education and prevention approaches for substance use um, are critical. It's definitely something um, that is even more important to recognize as we see the legalization of cannabis um, throughout the United States. And I'm in California and we passed uh, the law making it uh, legal for recreational use. It's been legal for several years for medical use here, but it is something to be aware of because I suspect we are gonna see a rise um, in the number of people who have problems with marijuana now that it's legal for recreational purposes because that tends to make people, especially young people, think that it's uh, certainly no more harmful than alcohol, and it may not be more harmful than alcohol, but it definitely legitimizes it um, on some level. So family history of either a mental health disorder is a risk factor for a co-occurring diagnosis, and it's important to recognize that. We discussed that in terms of um, prevalence rates you know, of mental health disorders, but it applies in terms of substance use disorders too. So if we see a family history, um, we know that that is a risk factor and we can take that into consideration for possible prevention efforts. Assessment for mental health disorders in the early stage of symptoms will facilitate prevention efforts. So if we see what are called the prodromal symptoms of a mental health disorder in someone, sometimes a young person, but not always a, a, a really young person, but if we see those prodromal symptoms um, and we are able to assess those early, we can oftentimes do a good job of, of prevention um, before a person has a full-blown um, psychosis or an episode that will lead them to um, end up in an inpatient hospital setting, inpatient psychiatric unit setting. Treatment for mental health disorders in the early stage will facilitate prevention of a substance use disorder, but there are still risk factors that are greater for some people than in the general population. So I wanted to make sure that we're aware of that. I know I've presented a lot of information in a fairly short period of time here. I would like to share briefly a little bit about my own personal history. I did allude to it in the an earlier part of my presentation. I am a recovering heroin and cocaine addict. I got very caught up in the counterculture lifestyle of the late 1960s and early 1970s in this country. I was born in 1953. Um, so I was uh, 16 years old in the in the late in 1969. I started using marijuana when I was 15 years old. I did get very involved in taking LSD in my teen years, not extensively, but probably about 20 or 25 times. And then I ended up um, in the mid 1970s um, experimenting with and eventually having problems with cocaine and heroin. I gave up my hard drug addiction 
in the early 1980s. And as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, I continue to smoke marijuana all day, every day until 2000. The reason I wanted to um, focus a little bit more on the prison population is because not only have I worked extensively over the last 16 years with people coming out of state prison and, and county jails, <clears throat> I myself am a former prisoner of the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. I was arrested on June 20, 2000 for transportation of marijuana and cocaine in California, and I ended up um, getting sentenced to six years in state prison. I served three years in San Quentin State Prison, which for those of you who might be in California, you will no doubt have heard of that. It's a very well-known and famous prison. It's the third oldest prison in the United States. I served three years of the six-year sentence because you get um, time off for good behavior. So I ended up um, deciding on the date of my arrest, which was on June 20, 2000, uh, that night in county jail, I decided that I was done with being involved with anything having to do with drugs, and I was never going to have anything to do with them ever again, including using them myself. And that's why June 21st, 2000 was my sober birthday. So on June 21st of, of 2020, I'll be celebrating 20 years in recovery. It's been a long journey to get to where I am. I did a lot of positive things while I was in prison. I was 47 years old when I went to prison, and I think I was determined that I was going to do something positive in there for other people. And I reached out to the people that I was in prison with. A lot of the men in there were functionally illiterate. And I helped them learn to read and write and do math and things like that. I helped many men pass their, gen, uh, their GED, get their GED. I worked with a lot of men who weren't even ready to take a GED yet and who had learning disabilities. I was a chapel clerk for my first six, um, for my last two and a half years in prison. I was a teacher's aide for my first six months there, but I was involved with former tutoring programs the whole time I was there. What I observed in prison was that many of the men that I was in prison with were people who struggled, um, for, had struggled med most of their lives, some from a very early age with substance use disorders, but many of them also had a co-occurring mental health disorder as well. And I decided early on in my time in San Quentin State Prison that I was going to dedicate the rest of my life to helping people who had substance use disorders. Um, there's nothing quite like waking up in a prison cell to make one reflect upon the choices that they've made in life. And so very, very early on, I made that decision. And I started reaching out to people even when I was in prison. I had my bachelor's degree from the 1970s, um, which in prison is very unusual. You don't meet too many people in prison who have college degrees or bachelor's degrees. And when I got out, uh, I, when I got out of prison, as I started working in the field of substance abuse treatment, I, I went back to school and got my addiction treatment counseling certification. I quickly discovered that many of the people I was working with who had substance use disorders also had histories of incarceration, histories of homelessness, and histories of mental health disorders. So I expanded my thinking um, to move into a direction of where I realized I needed to help people with their mental health disorders as well as their substance use disorders. And so I went to graduate school at that point to get a master's in social work degree, which I achieved in 2010, and I ultimately became a licensed clinical social worker. And I've really worked very much on the mental health side of the treatment industry for the last several years, but I've always worked continuously with people who are co-occurring because as we talked about at the beginning, many people or more than 50% of the general population of those who have a mental health disorder have a co-occurring substance use disorder and vice versa. So it's been something that I've been really dedicated to. I've been very, very fortunate to have opportunities to work in this field with many, many people who were accepting of the fact that I myself was in recovery um, and even more so accepting of the fact that I had a a record of criminal history, of felony convictions for the transportation of marijuana and cocaine um, um, record that I had. And I was fortunate that they saw me as someone who could provide valuable information to clients and to work with people actually who were coming out of the system. And I will say that I have had a lot of credibility working with clients who come out of the system of incarceration when they find out that I have that lived experience. I do not self-disclose that experience to everyone. I do self-disclose that when it's going to be helpful to the client. Something that is our rule of thumb always in the treatment field is that if you're sharing because about your own lived experience because it's going to be helpful to a client, then that is an acceptable reason to self-disclose your past. It is not acceptable to share it just because you want to share your story or because you somehow 
I want to get something out of sharing it. So I'm very, very discerning about who I share with that with. I am in a private practice clinician. I also do clinical supervision for a lot of programs. I've started, um, I started a program here in California for my county for people that were coming out of state prison who had mental health needs. So I've self-disclosed my background in some cases, but not in other cases. Many of my private practice clients have no idea whatsoever that I've ever had my own lived experience. Um, some of them do, but again, I'm very, very discerning and very careful. Uh, about it, uh, sharing that, and sometimes I only share a very small fraction of that. I don't share every detail of my uh, my story at all, only as it's relevant. So I did want to kind of self-disclose that. I, I want to make sure that people are aware of the fact that someone can go down the path that I went down, can, with hard work and patience, can recover, can do a good job of rebuilding their lives, and can make um, can make a difference in our society. I met so many men in prison who were so anxious to come out of the system and do good things with their life and be an asset to their community. Many of them want to help young people avoid the mistakes that they themselves made. Many of them want to really be um, leading full, productive lives and really um, want to make a difference in society and want to help our society be a better place to live. And so many of them feel like they're never going to be given that opportunity. It is very, very difficult for many of them to make it on the outside. And I want to make sure that I am really careful to make it clear that I am probably not a good representative of the average person who comes out of the prison system. I myself um, have a college degree. I grew up in a very close-knit family, middle-class family. I had a lot of opportunities in life and I had a tremendous amount of family support that did not waver while I was incarcerated and it was here for me my family was here for me when I got out of the prison system, um, which was November 2nd, 2003. Many, many people in our society coming out of the prison system do not have even close to the support system in place that I had. So while I'm probably a good representation of someone who can come out of the lifestyle that I came out of, who has all the, uh, who does well for themselves because they have the advantages in life, I'm not a good representation of the average person who gets out of the prison system. So I wanted to make sure um, that I stress that to people. Most people are much more from disenfranchised backgrounds. Many of them have had much more severe um, mental health issues and much more severe long-term problems with substance use disorder. Many of them have grown up in really, really difficult circumstances. I grew up in a healthy, loving, close-knit family. But keep in mind, when you're treating this population of people with co-occurring disorders, many, many of the people that we treat who have the, uh, have that diagnosis are people who have grown up in very traumatic situations, um, have uh, had a lot of chaos, uh, chaos in their life. Many of them have had learning disabilities and did not do well in the educational system. And oftentimes the educational system really failed them in a lot of ways. A lot of the people I met in prison, I would say, I would describe as being people who, because they um, had learning disabilities and didn't get adequate help for them in the educational system that they were involved in growing up, they fell by the wayside um, in that system. And so it was very, very difficult for them. So keep in mind that when we work with this population, that we are often working with people who have had multiple challenges in multiple domains in their lives, sometimes from the very, very earliest age on. I consider myself very, very fortunate to have had the second chance that we have, that I have in this society. And I think we live in a society that believes in second chances for people, but I don't think that we live in a society that believes so much in third, fourth, and fifth chances um, for people. I do believe in that. I do believe it's really important that we give people that opportunity. So I wanted to um, let everybody know that I am very, very fortunate to be where I am. I received a certificate of rehabilitation in 2011, and in 2016, I received a full pardon from the governor of California. So I'm very grateful um, for that as well. I am more than anything grateful for my sobriety, uh, grateful to be in recovery, grateful to have my health, and grateful to have the opportunity to, to work in the field of treatment. I'm fortunate that I found my true calling in life, fortunate that I've had the opportunity to maintain my health enough to allow me to, to pursue what I consider to be my true calling in life. And it's a blessing um, to be able to um, to be able to provide this information to people. Half of the reason I do the work I do is to help people. I am a professor um, for master's in social work programs for California State University Northridge, for Cal State University Long Beach here in California. 
and I've been able to um, have an opportunity to work with many young people who are going into the field of um, uh, clinical work. And I would I always say I do half the work that I do to help people and the other half to bring the next generation of people into our field because we desperately need that. So depending on your role in our in our system of care, I want to thank you for the work that you do. Uh, if you're in the in the process of obtaining your clinical license um, and you're just listening to this because you thought it might be interesting, I want to encourage you to go into the field because we really need that next generation of people to stay uh, to move into this field. We see a lot of problems continuing, a lot looming on the horizon. So we really need you, and we are um, we are fortunate to have you. I can be uh, email if you were to have any questions or any interest in communicating with me. The best way to reach me is by my email, and my email is david dd five one at hotmail dot com. So there's three D's. There's the last D in David, followed by two more D's. The number five, the number one at hotmail.com. If you are able to, uh, interested and are able to email me, I will be more than happy to respond to you. And I would look forward to the opportunity um, to communicate with you. I enjoy the opportunity to um, network with people. I'd be happy to be of service in any way that I can. And I want to thank you so much today for the opportunity to present and wish you all the best. Thank you so much. You've just finished listening to another exclusive continuing ed podcast by Clearly Clinical. If you like what you just heard and you need continuing ed credits, please visit us at clearlyclinical.com to check out our one-year membership, where you'll have access to our growing library of continuing ed podcast courses. Clearly Clinical, where our goal is to help you learn, grow, and shine.